All right, so uh, first, thanks to Caitlin. Uh, a few, I guess almost a month now, uh, a, month, a little over a month, uh, she asked for ideas for an upcoming session. And I threw out there in, in the thread, well, I've seen a lot of great things happening around COVID-19, uh, dashboards, uh, a lot of collaborative work on data as a result. And for me, it was a little bit inspiring of saying, hey, well, we made it work for this situation. I would love to see kind of more community engagement around open data, um, data for good. And so that was my suggestion for a session. And she took me up on it and, and we found some panelists. So I'm just gonna quickly introduce people on the team, on the panel, and then let them do their individual introductions. So from Looker, we have Leah Jarrett and Izzy Miller. Um, from QRI.io, not sure if I'm pronouncing it correctly. Uh, we have Chris Wong. And then we have Thomas Sladek from Gradient Metrics. So uh, go ahead and give your own individual introductions. Hey everybody, I'm Leah. Uh, I've been on the Looker team for a couple of years now and I manage all of our demo assets. So I help create demonstrations for our customers around different data sets. That's the coolest job. Um, I'm Izzy, I also work for Looker and I'm the community manager at Looker. So I run all of our community programs, which uh, ranges from support forums to occasionally cool open data projects or things like hackathons. And I have a science background. I studied botany and environmental studies. So a lot of the open data projects and stuff I pursue in my own time has to do with usually trees. Honestly, I really like trees, but in general, like sustainability or environmental type data. I thought there was one more person uh, oh. ahead of me, but I'll <clears throat> go. Uh, so. I'm Tom Vladek. Uh, I run a market research firm called Gradient Metrics, uh, which does sort of market research. And then Michael Kaminsky, who is in my top right corner, um, <laughs> probably different for everybody else. Uh, and I work together on a next generation media mix model called Recast. Um, so those are the two hats I wear. But then on, on this panel, I'll probably be talking mostly about my work on uh, a COVID dashboard called RT.live, um, which is, I think how I got involved on this panel. Uh, so my name is Chris Wong. Uh, company is called Query, um, which is kind of a, a play on uh, a play on querying databases, but uh, spelled QRI, um, but needs to be short because it's also a command line uh, command, um, similar to Git. So we are a data set version control platform. We're trying to do what uh, what um, do for data what GitHub did for uh, code. Um, so make it um, more easy to trust data because you can uh, verify its provenance, where it came from, who made changes to it when, that sort of thing. Um, but um, on this panel, I will, uh, yeah, I'm working on a, a couple of data set projects for query right now. I'm, I'm called an outreach engineer. Uh, I do everything from front end web development uh, to product management to uh, data, set, um, data set creation and sort of testing, kicking the tires on our platform. Um, so I have been doing some interesting open data projects. Um, the things that interest me are mostly urban planning related. I have a background in urban planning. Um, before I worked at Query, I ran a digital services team at the New York City Department of City Planning. Um, so lots of sort of land use and open space and uh, transportation and all these sorts of, of urban issues uh, interest me very greatly. So. And uh, I'll wrap it up. I guess I didn't introduce myself too much. I'm probably the least qualified person uh, to be kind of on this panel, which is good that I'm asking the questions more than answering them. Um, so I'm Fabio, I'm from Looker as well on the customer success engineering team. So helping our customers, um, you know, be successful with their whole end-to-end -end Looker deployment, including their data warehouse and their whole analytics stack. Um, and the reason for me personally, why I was, um, kind of drawn to this idea of collaborating on open data sets for good. I'm really interested in uh, environmental data sets, things like air quality and um, toxic, uh, toxic site data and things like that. So uh, I'll jump into our questions. And um, so with the format, I, I believe I'm just gonna throw the questions out there. 
Um, whoever wants to take a question can. Not every panelist needs to answer every question. Um, but for me, the first thing is like, I probably have a lot of different ideas on what would make good starts or good basis for projects. But I think, you know, probably one of the harder things is like picking one to get started with and to, you know, shift from ideation to doing. And so um, for you, when you're brainstorming or trying to evaluate ideas, um, what do you look for um, to say, yeah, this is an idea that I want to take to the next level? What makes a good open data project? Um, I'll, I can jump in and say the, I mean, you're generally, you know, unless, unless it's strictly for like demonstration purposes or trying to exercise some kind of technical approach to something, um, you know, you generally are saying, uh, going around looking for data to work on a project um, or to make a data set. It's, it, you know, you, you start with real world problems, of course. Um, and I guess two examples I can give very quickly are, um, I made a data set uh, or I compiled a data set of New York City public plazas uh, a few months back. And that all basically sprang from a tweet where somebody was questioning the legal status of a particular open space in lower Manhattan. Um, and that raised all kinds of questions around, you know, there, there are things that you would think are a street and things that you would think are a park and things that you would think are a public plaza, which is a, a specific designation of a uh, street space that is not used for, you know, traditional street uses. Um, and, you know, these all have meaning and they all have, you know, in theory have geographic boundaries, um, but there is no, no specific data set uh, existed at the time that would give you some kind of clarity about what, you know, what the extents of these things are. Um, so, you know, basically people asking questions in the real world uh, can usually easily translate into some kind of data need uh, so that's the first example. And the second one would just be the, the turnstiles data set um, that I've been uh, working with um, for the New York City MTA. Uh, I basically just produced a cleaned up version of it. And uh, it's, it's produced in a, a way that's kind of difficult to use. And um, I think that's just sort of, again, starting with the questions as everybody wants to know, especially after coronavirus hit, you know, how bad is the, is the decline in ridership on the subway? Um, that question is not terribly hard to answer, but if you want to start with the raw data that's published by the MTA, you're going to spend hours just learning how it's formatted and what you need to do with it. Um, so I wanted to make a data set that would, um, you know, cut that down from hours of, of grokking the data to minutes uh, of just downloading a CSV and treating it like you would, you know, normal data that you might find in a, in a published uh, sta status somewhere. Yeah, so I, I can answer. Oh, sorry, sorry. Go ahead. Uh, I was just going to say that when I'm starting to build out an open data set, I try to ask what is someone going to actually do with this data? Like what action are they going to take after they've seen the results? For example, if we're building out a Looker dashboard, is this just a vanity metric? Does someone just want to know what's going on? Or are they actually going to use the numbers that they're seeing on this dashboard to take some sort of action, whether that's an action in their individual business, you know, changing their policy around what stores they're going to reopen and how they're going to staff due to COVID spread or, you know, change a, um, you know, decide to have a meeting to strategize about some upcoming issue. So I always try to put that lens on of like, is there going to be some action item that follows this data project becoming available to other people? Or is it just going to be something that's cool to look at? Yeah, well, yeah, I really like that. Like the question of what open data project do you want to work on is really the same thing as the question of like, what are other people going to be interested in? And I've been kind of infatuated lately with the idea of like enrichment data sets, kind of like the COVID block that we put out at Looker where you take this data set, but it's really not wholly designed to be looked at by itself. It's not standalone per se, like you're intended to plug it into your existing data that we know or we assume is meaningful to you and like you <laughs> have a connection to and so we're enriching the data that you already have with this new open data set and i feel like that's the kind of thing that's like guaranteed to strike a chord with somebody if you release something super broad that they can plug into a diversity of different kinds of data so that's how i've been thinking about it i think it depends a little bit on how much um work will be required in the long run to make it uh make it something that you would consider successful 
because I, I was actually going to say something totally different, which is I think what you should work on is what you're most like intrinsically motivated to do, like what you find really, really interesting, um, which may be trees or maybe parks or maybe something totally different. Um, just because like for most of the projects to become something really successful will require, you know, a lot of time um, in, you know, nights and weekends time to make it like really polished and good. Um, and if you're not like really interested in the topic or interested in the model or interested in the data, um, it's going to be hard to be motivated to really do that. And I think for most people, like a lot of the projects, the world is so big now that even like very, very niche data sets have a pretty substantial audience. So in my mind, like if you're doing this just for sort of like out of your own interest, it's your own interest that is really determinative of what you should be working on. Um, and, you know, the other reason that's really important is that if you want other people to help you, you know, get it over the line or, you know, contribute some part of it. You really can't do that until something is built yet, right? You have to, you have to ask people to contribute to something that's already got momentum, not something that is still just like a glimmer in your eye. And so you need that initial motivation to get something off the ground uh, before you can start to ask other people to contribute. So I think it's really like in a lot of senses, just like, what are you really fired up about? You know, is it some new model? Is it some kind of data set? Is it a topic? Is it an interest area? Because that's what's going to be able to get you to take it over the line. I think I like I think that on for okay, there, go yeah. for it, Fabio. No, I think I would kind of like build on that, and we don't have to move on to the next question yet, because it sounds like there's kind of two perspectives and two ways of kind of going about things. From what I've heard, on the one hand. You, know, you could drive it from some intrinsic motivation and like build it and they will come and you'll get collaborators. On the other hand, you could kind of start by knowing that there's certain people that you want to collaborate with and who will take something that you can build and will work on it further. And so like I, I kind of see there's these two alternatives. But go ahead, Izzy. Well, I was going to say, I actually, my most recent open data interaction was the exact opposite of what I said and exactly what Thomas said, where <laughs> I discovered uh, a tree data set, exploretrees.sg, which is a really tiny little map of Singapore, like just Singapore, that had this incredible visualization of all the trees planted there and various information about them that I guess was available in a table somewhere, but had never been visualized like that. And I, of course, like zoomed out immediately and was like, where am I? How can I get to California? And it was just Singapore. And so that was a project that like probably wasn't heroic scale and didn't take this person that long because it was just Singapore, but it sparked my brain. I emailed them. I was like, how can I do this where I am? And they sent me all these resources and said, yeah, pretty much every city actually has these logs of all the trees planted in them. They just store them away. In places people aren't so likely to find them and so I'm now working with her and trying to build it out for Santa Cruz and San Francisco where I'm from so I, I think I might end up agreeing with Tom because that little seed that was super attainable was like something that sparked my interest and now I want to build on it whereas before I might not have gotten sucked in so I'm on board I, I mean I would throw out like the people who built that for Singapore didn't build it for you um, but they opened it for you um, so that, you know, like th that's the, the beauty of it is that it doesn't, it's like their interest is not, they may have like the, the primary interest in actually understanding trees in Singapore, but a secondary interest in, um, or maybe no interest at all, but at least just be open so that it's on the table that other people can benefit from it. Obviously it sounds like they were engaging and actually helping you with resources as opposed to just publishing stuff. Um, but it comes down to, it, it, I would just reiterate that like, you know, that like helping, uh, Helping people in other cities necessarily do that isn't the main motivation, but um, it's, it's in there somewhere and that's awesome. Uh, an awesome sort of part of the openness that people generally engage in when they're doing this kind of work. So if I could, uh, I had a question about around like finding collaborators, but I think um, given the talk we've just had, I want to sk skip forward to the next question, which is um, I'm interested in how you 
break down and coordinate the work on what could potentially be a larger uh, longer term project. Um, and I think it's really important because, you know, if you start out, even if you're starting out on a small bit of the work, like collecting a new data set or um, standardizing uh, a good format for a data set that exists but is unwieldy um, or something kind of more end to end, like showing um, a visualization on top of an existing data set, having a good structure in place, I feel like can really be um, really facilitate collaboration in the long run. Um, so, you know, the first time that you do it, you might kind of like do your own slice of the project, but leave things in a, in a way that's a little bit unusable for other people. So I'm wondering, uh, are there boilerplates, templates, best practices that are really reusable for somebody who's going to go into their, into a project for the first time? Um, I think about, you know, when I go to a GitHub repository and I see like, the badges for I'm doing continuous integration, or I see like a standardized directory structure for here's my source code, here's my dis like distributable. Um, so are there kind of similar parallels when you're working with um, data sets that you want to collaborate openly on um, so that you can kind of like start from these boilerplates and not trip over just organizational issues as the project grows and matures? So I'll jump in and, and take a first stab at this. So the RT.Live project uh, right off the bat became huge. So like the the group doing it is like all of the PyMC3 development team, um, including like uh, myself and the Instagram founders and some of the folks from Instagram. So it's like probably like 40 people that are working on it or maybe even a little bit more. And it was like a disaster for a while um, which was surprising to me. Um, and because there wasn't like an organizational structure really in place, um, and like people were filing GitHub issues they were all over the place. The modeling team of which I was a part was just kind of like running like a thousand different directions. Like I'm going to prototype it using ordinary differential equations. I'm going to prototype it using this paper. I'm going to prototype it using this solver. Um, but like none of those different directions that we were trying could like get folded into the pipeline or they would have all these problems that made them like totally uh, unusable <laughs> for the site um, because there were severe limitations on how quickly we had to estimate the model every day. So I think that like on the one hand, the organization of the project is, is almost like if it's that big, it needs to be run very similarly to like a company, there needs to be people that own specific areas, whether that's the data cleaning, whether that's the pipeline, whether that's the model. Um, and there needs to be issues written up that people can like pull down and, and address. But like, I would say that the sort of, aside from that, there also needs to be like a focus on the people that are contributing to make the contributions like fully workable, like end to end. And that was a big problem that we were having that like, so from the organizational perspective, you need to do everything that like a company might do if the project team is big, which is to say, assign owners, assign issues that people can do. But from like the worm's eye perspective, if you're a participant, the way that you can make yourself the most helpful is to make sure that you're not doing just one piece of the puzzle, which was a problem that we had. You know, somebody would focus on like one part of the model and that model would take an hour and a half to run uh, and it wouldn't work across multiple cores. And we have 50 states that we have to estimate every day. That's just not going to work. Um, and, or they wouldn't integrate their code with the pipeline or integrate it with the, you know, airflow DAG. And so it was just, it was cool to see different approaches being used, but it was one isolated piece. And if they had put more effort into integrating it with the rest of the, uh, the project, it could have been something that we would actually use. And so we had a big problem where I was like, okay, that's cool and neat, but it needs to go into production. Um, so I think those are like, for, from those two different perspectives, like on the one hand, you need to get people to say, yes, I'm owning the pipeline. And then on the other hand, like if you're contributing, you need to make sure that your co contributions go end to end and are not just something that like are kind of cool, but wouldn't actually work in practice.
So I would I'd jump in uh, on and say, you know, I actually had uh, for the, again, the, the New York City subways turnstile data set, which I was referring to earlier, um, you know, it didn't start out as something that was, you know, meant to be collaborative, but uh, like everything we do at Query and like everything I do with most of my projects uh, was just, everything was out in the open. Um, so we have a GitHub repository where we put all of our scripts and I have a, a data pipeline that I run every weekend, uh, which is mostly like shell scripts and SQL um, that does all of this. Uh, and then every, every week um, I publish a new version of the cleaned up data set. Um, but because that stuff is open source, uh, people, you know, people who are interested can kind of keep digging and digging and digging um, if they want to, if they want to figure out, you know, where something went wrong, or maybe if they found something that was, you know, nuanced and didn't make any sense, uh, they can fix that. So while I'm, I'm really interested in like making this pipeline exist, I'm not particularly interested in any one subway station. Um, and this person on Twitter, you know, just a few days ago was and said, wait a minute, you've, your lookup table, you know, the little lookup table that you're using to to connect turnstiles to stations is missing these three stations, right? And there's 400 and some odd stations in the city. Um, so the level, like the amount of time it would have taken for me to QA every single one of these is not, not reasonable. Um, but I, you know, I got it to a certain point and the next person can kind of jump in to fill whatever their needs are. Um, so it wasn't really coordinating for work. It's just kind of being open and saying, you know, if anyone wants to help, like it's there. Um, on the template slash boilerplate that actually resonates a lot with what we're doing at Query because uh, at Query we've kind of, we've built like a new data structure that includes more than just the data. You can just think of it as like combining metadata and data under one, um, under one schema or under one uh, document. Uh, I don't know how to describe it better than that right now. Um, but basically, uh, you know, in that is also a readme. So the things you would expect to find in a GitHub repository, you can now find in, in a data set as we define it, uh, which includes a readme, metadata, structure information, and the actual data itself. Uh, and they all kind of live together and get, and get versioned together. Um, one thing that, that people have come up with, or, you know, one idea that we floated, which has been really interesting, is the idea of coming up with like a, uh, you can actually make a schema for a data set that is like a wish list that says, I wish, I wish this table existed and I wish its columns looked like this and had, you know, booleans and text and whatever, um, and not actually have the data. But if you publish that on query or public, just publish it in general, um, you know, it still becomes a discoverable thing. Uh, the data is not there, but there's somebody out there who's made a readme that says, I wish I had this and actually started planning out the schema of that data set. Um, and, you know, if maybe somebody will stumble along uh, later on and find it and say, I know how to fill that schema. Um, so that's uh, that's that's kind of something we're interesting that we're doing on uh, a template for a data set at Query. Wait, Chris, so Query, I, I haven't heard of it before. It's kind of like Git for data. Like you can version the schemas and commit and branch and mess around with it and then pull from master. Exactly. Um, so they, we're trying wow. to solve the sort of chaos of, uh, of files that you know, you're going to inevitably deal with when you deal with data um, and just downloading, you know, downloading the same data set uh, one week apart might get you completely different data. Um, so we have the ability to diff uh, structured data. We have the ability to, um, uh, you know, basically publish. Uh, we, I guess I would describe it as we want to make it just as easy to publish as it is to consume. Right now, anybody can download CSVs, but putting them back up if you make changes to them is a very difficult task. Uh, and we want to make that as easy as it is to push to Git, which is still still hard, but like not that hard. That's awesome. That feels really useful. Um, so the next question I have, again, we might have different um, experiences on this based on you know coming at it from working within a company, working on it as a personal project. Um, you know, I've done some kind of like personal projects where I've put my credit card on GCP and like prayed that nothing goes wrong and, and try to set some control. But the, the question comes down to uh, data sets can either scale up really big in terms of amount of data that you're working with, or, you know, if something becomes popular in, t in terms of usage. So when those become large, obviously cost can become a factor. And if you're working on this kind of like data for good, a lot of times there might not be a real funding source for it. So I'd just like to hear like from work that people have done, kind of have you run into cost challenges um, and what are some ways that you can mitigate those um, 
are, is there any like approach that you like in terms of combination of technology for open data sets or um, kind of like method for like a contribution from the community for paying for those costs or corporate kind of uh, funding or things like that? Um, I know I ran into this issue a lot with developing the COVID data um, and other data sets as well. Obviously, the volumes get really big very quickly. Uh, I think BigQuery to me was really easy to cut costs on and kind of understand at least what the cost would be because it's really easy to estimate, estimate like gigabytes per query and do the math based on that. And the BigQuery public data sets program also offers some relief if there are data sets for good where they won't charge you for certain queries that are processed. So I think that was really helpful, but obviously it's a huge problem. And I think for me, one thing that's been really helpful is just trying to do that estimation in my head. Like, hey, if there are this many rows, that's about this many gigabytes, which is about this, and this is how much it's gonna cost to scale it in my head before going through that build process. It's interesting to me that like it's there are free tiers on BigQuery and stuff like that where you don't pay up to a certain point, but after a certain point you can start racking up costs pretty quick. But if you move away from SQL, there are things like Colab or I think there I'm forgetting the name of it, but there are other things that give you pretty high powered instances that you can run Python on and analyze data like for free perpetually. So I found myself for really big data sets actually just bailing out of SQL altogether and dumping all the data out and just running a collab, like a, a notebook basically with a super high powered GPU that I can mess around with pandas and visualize it all in there, which is kind of sad because I love SQL and like building on stuff in Looker, but that is like the forever free way to work on huge data sets in, in my opinion. Like, I've been able to do things that are crazy with like machine learning and stuff and it's all completely free as long as you don't mind your instance getting timed out every couple hours and having to re-import everything but it is weird i guess i don't i don't know how the actual infrastructure works but i wonder why there aren't those sort of perpetually free spot instances for databases and like a, a sql equivalent Um, I'll go ahead and answer my own question. Like uh, when I was putting things up that were publicly accessible, that would be like build by usage. I found it quite strange that there wasn't the ability to put like a cap on, um, you know, your spend in the platform itself. I did find like kind of hacky solutions to like, oh, set up this cloud function that triggers based on your spend and will shut things down for you, um, which kind of worked for me to feel okay about it. But like one thing that would be super cool is if there would be some kind of model that, you know, could be developed that um, on a publicly facing uh, portal that has this information that uh, it actually just shows like consumption costs and allows people to kind of like fund the, the usage of the portal. But um, I guess hopefully nobody has been in that dire situation where they've had to like shut down a, a, a thing that they've done for good just because like so many people are using it that then it becomes a burden to, to maintain. That's a nice idea. You always see sort of like the buy me a coffee link servers are expensive, but it would be kind of cool to see like how much you just cost somebody by fiddling around with their data set for 10 minutes. I feel like that would definitely guilt me into donating for sure. Um, so the next question I have is also kind of um, probably a factor that doesn't come up so often, but I think it's good to have in mind um, when we talk about, you know, open source software, there's a lot of thought given to licensing. Um, and I feel like when I see open data sets that I have access to, typically the licensing information is usually less upfront or there's not licensing and you have to reach out to people. Um, kind of what has your experience been in working on projects around the licensing of open data? Um, 
is there something that you see really often or do you really see that you have to kind of reinvent the wheel every time and like reach out to people and, and get approval and So in, uh, in my experience, it has just simply never been an issue um, because we're mostly working with COVID data, which everyone has just very permissively put out there. Um, and the states are sort of publishing it for free and uh, pretty much every reporting geography has been like, here, please take this and do something with it. Um, so it's just not, not something, that, uh, luckily in the COVID world, everybody's just been like, please, go take this data, do something with it, tell us what's going on. Uh, so it just hasn't ever come up. Honestly, I never even thought about it, um, about there could possibly be a licensing issue or we're stepping on somebody's toes. So that's just never come up um, in my experience. Um, I think I... we end up... Go for it. Oh, so, yeah, we, uh, we end up, uh, oh, sorry, those of us on the query team who are like populating data onto our platform uh, end up scraping a lot of data sets and, and um, like, you know, we, we're, we probably don't throw a license on it uh, and, it, you know, hasn't, hasn't come up yet that anyone is like, hey, why are you, why are you scraping and republishing this data set? Uh, but um, other times is data that we pull directly off of another open data portal that already has a license. Um, but I would just say like it, it, it hasn't come up a whole lot uh, that anyone scrutinizes those licenses much. Um, it's just, it's, it's a, I think you quickly, you delve into this. I mean, every, everything we're, we're dealing with is public uh, for the most part right now. So I, I just don't think there's much uh, like there's, there's, it may have a license on it, but it's already open data. And I don't think anybody's really scrutinizing that, um, that, that there's probably another gray area once you start dealing with, private data sets that are you know, obtained through, you know, mutual understanding between two entities and things like that uh, and how those things get used, but it just doesn't come up much in our day to day. Yeah, I was going to say similar thing about web scraping, basically. I also have not thought about this very much, but it just made me remember a few years ago, I downloaded and worked on a rock climbing data set for my Looker thesis project. We do a little thesis projects to get to know the tool. Um, and halfway through my project, it got DMCA takedown. The GitHub repo got taken down by a digital millennium copyright act request because the data had been scraped from this website and they owned it, which I guess is their right. Um, I hadn't even considered that fact so I, I didn't, I just stopped using that data set basically and froze it where it was and didn't think much of it again after that. But it was interesting now to think about that some little hodunk rock climbing website is actually out there making sure that people aren't publicizing or using their data in ways that they don't. I was surprised. Yeah, I am, I am generally glad that issues tend to not come up in most cases. It's just um, as, as an area that receives less attention, I wanted to spend a minute talking about it. Um, the next thing would be, I know we did our introductions um, and we all kind of mentioned what areas we find interesting, um, but I'm just hoping for people on the call, we can find some inspiration today. So uh, I'd love to talk about kind of like what specific open data project you would kind of like most love to see spring into existence personally. Uh, I, I mean, I've got a pet project that I've been working on for probably 10 years uh, on and off, you know, every time I get a couple weekends uh, and it, it just boils down to, to good budget data for a uh, city of New York, but I guess that can be extended to budget data everywhere. Um, but uh, an, an early scraping project when I was, you know, learning how to code more seriously many years ago was uh, scraping, uh, scraping lines out of these thousand, thousands, many thousands of page long PDFs that the, the government reports the, the budget in. Um, so you can get like, you can get data sets of aggregated budget spends by category, but to get the like really granular information about uh, individual, um, I guess the lowest level of accounting for budgeting. 
uh, is extremely difficult and you have to scrape the PDFs. Um, so I've, I've written in many different languages and many different iterations, things that do this. So I've made them exist, but it's so, it's so complicated and nuanced that, uh, you know, it would really need like a whole, a whole nonprofit or a team or something to actively be maintaining this and updating it every time the new budget comes out and things like that. Um, so those are the kinds of things I'd love to see. And then of course the dashboarding and user interface tools that would work on top of that to help people understand uh, how we actually spend money uh, as a city. Um, so that, that's my, you know, dream data set. So it's less open data and more open model, um, which is where my interests are. It's more on the modeling side than on the data side, but one idea that I've been tooling around with that I'm really interested in is um, a model to help people make dis better decisions about where they give their money to political races. So um, what I'm sort of dreaming of is like an interface where you're able to go, you know, my key issues are climate change, uh, you know, healthcare, et cetera. And I want these outcomes, like where should my limited budget get directed in order to achieve those? Um, and I think like something like the MVP would be um, delivering a like a um, a threshold calculator. So like, what is the mo Senate race that is most likely to tip the Senate, or you know, what is the uh, state uh, presidential race that's most likely to tip the the presidential election? So that already exists uh, on the presidential side. I haven't seen anything that specifically does it for the Senate, although with all of the probabilistic forecasts that exist, it's not like a super heavy lift to do that for the Senate. And then you can imagine like layers and layers and layers of adjustments that add sophistication to that kind of model um, that would sort of like aid in the decision-making of somebody that wants to give money to political campaigns um, as opposed to just like, I'm donating to my local race or uh, I saw this campaign ad and it moved me. Um, I'd want to be like, no, 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 out of all of the possible races that exist, and if I have this preferred outcome, uh, where is my dollar maximizing its efficiency? Uh, that's an idea that I've been sort of playing around with. There's a, a group that does something close to it. They don't publish any of the details of their model. I have no idea if they actually do any modeling. Um, I think it's called like Blueprint by Swing Left. But uh, that concept in general is something that I, I think should exist, and I'm very interested in it. And that's the kind of thing, even if, like you said, the data isn't being worked on collaboratively, just having the model publicly available for people to look through lends it so much cred, not being a, a black box. Yeah, that's right. I mean, I like, for example, I went through the swing left, like flow, onboarding flow, and then I did not become a member because I was like, I have no idea what you're doing with this information. <laughs> like, I will. I don't know how you're making the decisions, which races you're giving to. Um, so I'm not going to do that. But yeah, you know, that's, that's not even like to the point where they're um, exposing model artifacts. Like here's how we came to this decision and here are the races and here are the probabilities that they're going to go one way or another. And we want the ones that have like, that are the most um, sort of the biggest swing races. Those are the ones that have the most like, impact on the outcomes and here are the ones where they have a stated position on climate change or something like that. They didn't even go that far, let alone publishing the code. So yeah, it's to the point where, yeah, you need some sort of credibility enhancing device for that to be useful. And I think making it transparent is, is a major one. So I'm, I'm pretty interested in that. I've had this idea for a long time. Did you ever play Age of Mythology when you were kids? I never had a computer or video games that I'd always played at my friend's house and it had this thing called like the fog of war and basically like when you started the map was a black box and as you explored and built stuff and visited places the map would semi-permanently reveal itself but it would occasionally close back up and you wouldn't you wouldn't have visibility over the map anymore and I've been thinking about how cool it would be and super collaborative to try and do something like that for the earth to have a map of the world and plug in various data sets, like maybe in, where Instagram photos are being taken and those places are revealed every day and the rest is kind of shrouded in fog where you can add in four square check-ins or like anonymized cell phone data. And you can see in a city or in the entire world, like where are people today? Or what I think is more interesting, like where are people not right now? 
And will that inspire people to go there? Like, could you get people out in the world exploring new places? And it feels to me like the kind of thing that people could plug in a bunch of disparate data sets into. Like if they had Strava data, they could pop that in and you'd slowly compile a totally not creepy fog of war map of like what places in the last week have not been explored by humanity. Like we should go there. That's an idea that's always been sitting in my head, but it's kind of huge. <laughs> I feel like those were all really like fun, cool examples. And the first thing that came to my head is I'm always trying to build new demos for our customers or help them do interesting analysis. But of course we need like enterprise level data to test out these things or to build demos. And I'm finding that it's really hard to just get fake enterprise data that makes sense that we can tell a story with. Even a lot of applications that are widely used, um, you know, like different SaaS applications that are used by lots of different companies, they don't publish any like sample data sets that you can use for testing. Um, a couple of them have like plugins where you can generate demo data or random data, but that's always on my like wish list for public data sets, you know, to include, you know, sample enterprise data sets so that we can allow the open source community to further develop tools that can be leveraged by businesses. Um, I'll go as well. Uh, I just realized now after all the meeting musical chairs at the beginning that I've had my video turned off the whole time and didn't realize it. <laughs> um, but, you know, for me, I discovered the EPA um, air quality data set that I've been really interested in and working with. And I've done a little bit of work on it, but what I found that the data is quite old, unfortunately, um, at least the public data set that I had access to isn't updated frequently. Um, and also pulling together data sets from like super fun sites and toxic sites to make like a really personally actionable kind of um, data set for um, people to individually help inform uh, themselves. Um, I've been, I currently live in North Carolina and found like a good kind of state level data set that's even more um, detailed than like the super fun list. So I've been looking around in that um, and kind of like use it for myself, but I would love to do a project around that. Oh, yeah, I've been, I was thinking earlier about the live data, like the freshness of the data thing too. And Tom, I, I loved that your URL is rt.live. Like, yes, this is up-to-date data that you can use to think about tomorrow or next week. And I've found that even just the questions that people ask when they're using a data set that's fresh are different than the questions they ask if they're using a data set from years ago. Like you're no longer saying, hmm, what interesting things can we pull out from this data set? Like who has the most points or something? If it's live, you can and are more likely to ask questions like what's gonna happen tomorrow? Or like, can we do a regression and extrapolate this? Like people start thinking about how to use the data more actionably. I wish there were more live data sets out there. And one that I found, cause I was just looking around for live data sets to do something with, and I wish I, I wish people were doing more with it, is this global database of um, events, language and tone. I don't know what it is, it's called GDELT. And it's this huge data set that just every single day takes the pulse of like all of the news media in the world and doesn't return the article content, but returns a huge amount of metadata about like every piece of news being published. And it's updated every single day. And that feels like, like what I was talking about earlier with enrichment data sets that you can plug into another data set or use as like another dimension to confirm a, a, an assumption or like add another layer to the data. That feels like this incredible resource. Like I think it has sentiment so you can get a general pulse for the sentiment of the day in the news. It's this massive live data set that like describes the world and I really haven't seen that many projects done on it, which made me kind of sad. So I'd like to see something pop up using GDAL. But it is also, it's enormous. So maybe that's why people are shy of it. And I so, think it's a big query public data set also. So um, 
first thing I want to say before kind of like opening it up for Q and A is I've been kind of like silently watching the chat feed and there are so many resources in there and so many links. I'm definitely going to go after the, um, after the zoom and like just pour over all of these. I'm super excited to do that. Um, but since we have nine minutes left, uh, I'm done with the questions that I prepared and I bet there's a bunch of questions from attendees. Or not. I can jump in. I have, <clears throat> I have like a crazy question. Andrew, you're, so, uh, you're to... Ooh, am I muted? Oh, oh no. Oh, wait, I know what's going on. Um, we can hear you. Oh, sweet. Okay. Um, but yeah, uh, like a couple of years back, I was in a data science for social good program. And so like from that, we tried to like build um, a model to help detect damages from satellite images um, of just pure RGB. Um, and like we took Hurricane Harvey data and tried to figure out like, is there any possible way that you can just use satellite imagery to highlight areas that were massively damaged? And there was a story of a city I don't recall anymore, but like it was re extremely relevant because one city had like no early signs of damage and that's because their like phone lines were cut. And so they couldn't actually report damage in their area. So that's kind of like the inspiration for the project. Our deadlock was like, when we reached the end of that, we had what these like, I think we were close to three terabytes of images stripped down to like a hundred gigabytes instead or a couple hundred gigabytes instead. So a lot more manageable and we got to like retile them. So it's like easier for people to use. We got to like pour over bounding boxes because like the damage was just a point. And so what we did was we had to contact and like it goes back to when you guys asked, um, do you like ask permission when you get like a new data set and like how do you share? So we got them from the county's offices and had to ask the counties if it was fine that we share these like um, parcel boxes um, or parcel land maps. Um, eventually, like we got manual approval of like just saying in an email, yeah, sure, feel free to share it. But when we got to the end, there was no way for us to share the compressed images for free. Has anyone like found solutions. I know like you can kind of host an S3 bucket. So we kind of, we did that route, route where we hosted the images in S3 bucket. We tried to publish it through like the IEEE's um, free hosting platform, but it actually puts a paywall in front of you before you can download the data set. You have to buy like IEEE credits. So I'm just curious if anyone's reached like that scale where it's like hundreds of gigabytes need to be shared out or seen projects that you guys have stumbled upon in the past. I think Izzy mentioned this last one was like a pretty big data set that I was peeking around. I see a lot of that stuff um, as torrents. And I guess you have to reach a critical mass of users for that to work because you need cedars. Um, and it would it's sad if something dies out. But I see a lot of projects offer a torrent option as well as a direct download option. They're like, please, please don't click the direct download button. Um, so even just having that option, even if maybe on a given day, like you're the only seater and you've shut down your computer, they can use the direct download. But having that option, I think if you are in fact getting enough traffic that it's costing you a lot of money, um, it will probably save you a lot of money to offer a peer-to-peer -peer distributed download mechanism. Plus it feels kind of illegal to use torrents. You know, it's fun. People like people like living on the edge. I bet Google would send me another email saying, you need to uninstall that in seven days. <laughs> uh, what I did, it, actually, I totally got, I, I was downloading this data set um, of all of the, this is a funny project that I have not completed, but there are dumps of all of the dark net market forums, like the Silk Road, if anyone remembers that, back in the day was the thing where you'd buy drugs online, basically. And in addition to the website, they had these forums that were so active and every other Silk Road clone had their forums too. And so there's like hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of gigabytes, if not thousands of just forum chatter of these criminals. Um, and I thought it would be really fun to take a huge dump of that 
and take a dump of nextdoor.com data, which I think of as like the neighborhood watch. Like they're the they're the cops of the neighborhood. They're the they're the squares, as it were, and just see what the difference is. Like who's more friendly or who has tighter bonds. Like I I do community management, and so I often am looking at community data and seeing like how tightly knit are the communities or where are these outlier groups or how many people are not connected to anyone else in the community like visualizing it kind of like a like a force directed graph or a network map community and i really wanted to look at network maps of these two very different in philosophy communities and it was available as a torrent and i started downloading it and i got an email from my security team saying hey knock it off delete that immediately mm -hmm. i was like it's kind of for work sort of <laughs> hey uh we only have a few minutes left, so I know Chris um, had a comment about cost earlier that seems to be relevant to the current question, so um, oh, go ahead. Uh, sort of. Um, I mean, the question was about where, like, where can I publish data? I, I don't think uh, query would work out for what you're talking about specifically, uh, which is, you know, which is raster image data. Um, it might. But uh, but basically, the yeah, query is built on top of IPFS uh, specifically for that purpose that um, we have we have Query Cloud, which is sort of the analog to GitHub, where you can publish stuff. But if your stuff gets so huge, um, the format works without the cloud part, and you can you can run your own uh, run your own instance anywhere you can, uh, and just fill it up. Then you're limited only by the size of your hard drive. Um, but I wanted to say that the the story about torrenting reminds me of way back in 2014. I I received for the first well not for the first time, but I shared for the first time the. Uh, taxi trip sheet data for New York City, which I obtained via FOIL request and I actually had to drop off a hard drive and pick it up. So it was about 50 gigs of data. Uh, and I asked that same question to the internet, what can I do with, I, like, I wanna share this, but I don't know where to put it. Uh, and somebody was like, put it on torrent and I made a torrent of it. Uh, and then in very short order, somebody else came along and just offered to host it uh, as a direct download because so many people wanted it, uh, which was way outside of my, my, you know, I didn't have the resources to do it, but but I guess I would just reiterate by, by being open uh, and basically broadcasting your need, uh, you never know who might come along and decide to help you. So I'll leave it with that. So it looks like we, <laughs> Izzy said he's used that data set. So uh, I think that's just representative of um, the people who are on the call today and the people who will watch the call after it's published in Locally Optimistic. Um, I think all the discussion is going to be inspiring for, for lots of people. So I, I think we did a good job here. And thank you, Caitlin, for helping to get it kicked off. And Caitlin, if you want to wrap anything up in terms of like locally optimistic. Um, no, um, I mean, would love to see this conversation continue. It, it's been awesome and super interesting. But uh, yeah, I think that's a great note to end on. So I hope everybody has an awesome afternoon. And uh, we'll see you around. Thanks, everyone.